Even her detractors admit that the charitable work of the Catholic Church has been extraordinary. But today, we're going to see that Catholic charity has historically been even greater than Catholics themselves may realize. So join me today for the Catholic Church, Builder of Civilization. Welcome to the Catholic Church, Builder of Civilization. I'm Thomas Woods. Today we're talking about Catholic charity. Now we all think we know all about Catholic charity, and indeed we do know a great deal about it. Even her opponents admit that the Catholic Church has done more charitable work than you can possibly believe. But Catholic charity is in fact even greater than people realize. And today we're going to explore why. For instance, it's the quality of the charity as well as the quantity. It's not simply that the Catholic Church did a lot of good work for people. That we'll look at in a moment. But it's the spirit that animated that charity as well. So for instance, the Catholic Church taught that you should help somebody not because you expect a reward or you're going to keep hectoring this person forever that you owe me something, remember I helped you three and a half years ago, or you don't do it so that you can show the world what a great person you are. You do it because it pleases God, because you respect a fellow human being as being made in the image and likeness of God, and that you know that charitable work pleases Him. This is why you do it. You do it out of a love for God and your fellow man, not because you expect any kind of reciprocity. Beyond that, we have even the counsel from the church that you should even help your own enemies. What are you, crazy? In the ancient world, they would have thought that was crazy. In ancient Greece and Rome, that would have been considered absurd. And indeed, in the ancient world, a lot of the giving was self-interested. It was not given out of the pure desire simply to help a fellow human being. So the quality, the kind of charitable work, the spirit that animated it, was very different in the Catholic world than it had been in the world that preceded the church. But we should not at the same time disparage the question of quantity, because here too the church excelled. Because for the first time you had institutionalized care for the, for the sick and widows and orphans and the poor. Now again, there had been generosity shown in the ancient world, no one would deny that but nowhere near the level that we see under the Catholic Church. Now remember my rule, I want to cite anti-Catholics whenever I can to show that what I'm saying really is true, because even an opponent of the Church admits it. Well, I'm fond of citing a historian from the 19th century named W.E.H. Lecky, because he was known to be an opponent of the Catholic Church, and yet, when he wrote about this subject, and he spanned the historical record, he concluded that there is no question that neither in practice nor in theory, neither in the institutions that were founded, nor in the place that was assigned to it in the scale of duties, did charity in antiquity occupy a position at all comparable to that which it has obtained by Christianity. So it's both the quality and the quantity of the Catholic charitable work that distinguishes it and makes it so historically interesting and compelling. Now, one objection can be raised to what I've said so far. There was an ancient school of philosophical thought called Stoicism. And the Stoics did indeed seem to be people who called for doing good deeds out of a sense of duty and without any expectation of reciprocity. The Stoics, in effect, believed that the wise man was a man who had no emotional connection to the world, who was such a master of his own person that he was utterly unperturbed by outside events, no matter how tragic. 
Well, it was in that spirit, that very, in a sense, empty kind of spirit of merely discharging your duty, that the Stoics engaged in charitable work. Yes, they taught that the wise man knows that he is a citizen of the world and all men uh, are, in effect, uh, to be cared for, but they are to be cared for without lending any emotional attachment to the relationship. So, for example, Seneca, who was a Stoic, said, the sage will console those who weep, but without weeping with them. He will succor the shipwrecked, give hospitality to the proscribed, and alms to the poor, restore the son to the mother's tears, save the captive from the arena, and even bury the criminal. But in all, his mind and his countenance will be alike untroubled. He will feel no pity. He will do good, for he is born to assist his fellows, to labor for the welfare of mankind, and to offer each one his part. His countenance and his soul will betray no emotion as he looks upon the withered legs, the tattered rags, the bent and emaciated frame of the beggar. But he will help those who are worthy, and like the gods, his leaning will be toward the wretched. But it is only diseased eyes that grow moist in beholding tears in other eyes. Well, that was the spirit of the charity of the Stoics. So they, they themselves were, were to be unperturbed by outside events, by the misfortunes of those whom they helped. And so naturally, they were perhaps not as eager to go out looking for evil because they, in effect, tried to ignore the existence of evil. They did not make the kind of emotional connection that we see, for example, in a Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa, these people were not. In fact, we have example after example of Stoics being given bad news. For instance, Sir, your child has just perished. And we hear the Stoic reply so flippantly, saying things like, Well, had to go sometime. Who on earth would say that? when losing a child. But that was how the Stoic demonstrated his complete mastery of the outside world. I'm unperturbed by this. Nothing can affect me. I do not let my emotions get the better of me. Now, getting back to the Catholic Church, where does this spirit of Catholic charity come from? Well, it comes from her founder. It comes from the teaching of Christ himself, who of course said to us, a new commandment I give unto you that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. St. Paul went to an even greater extreme to some people when he specifically noted that you should show charity even toward your enemies. Now, Christ instructed that of us as well. But St. Paul was cited repeatedly uh, on this front, and his letters were cited repeatedly by early church fathers to encourage people to follow the counsel of St. Paul, and in fact to do good even for their enemies. Now, we're going to talk more about Catholics doing good for their enemies a little bit later, but for right now, let's look at early church history and see them taking the words of Christ and making them into reality. We already see that in early church history, during the context of the Mass, the faithful's offerings for the poor would be placed on the altar. Early Christians also imposed fasts on themselves so that they could save the money they would otherwise use to buy food and give that to those who were in need. Now the church fathers even, who as I said in a previous episode were prolific writers and that St. Isidore of Seville once said that if you tell me that you've read everything St. Augustine wrote, you're obviously a liar. Yet they found time to do this because this is an indispensable part of the Christian life. St. Augustine, for instance, established a hospice for pilgrims, ransomed slaves, and gave away clothing to the poor. In fact, he told people, don't give me expensive clothing as a gift. You may like me, you may be impressed with my writing and my speaking. But don't give me expensive clothes because I'm not going to wear them. I'm just going to sell them and give the proceeds to the poor. St. Cyprian and St. Ephraim organized relief efforts during times of plague and famine. Now, Saint